Welcome everybody to our Kickstart Your Autumn Tree ID Skills Workshop. It's really great to see everybody here. We've got lots of people in the room from all over the UK and beyond, which is fantastic. And lots of first timers as well live with us in this Zoom call. Um, if you're watching live, hello and thanks for joining us. And if you're watching the YouTube recording afterwards, thanks for taking the time out to uh, watch the workshop and I hope you get a lot out of it. Firstly, let's talk about what we're doing. This workshop's gonna last about an hour long. We may run over a little bit, but uh, you know, if you have to go, you can always watch the recording later. Um, if it's your first time in these workshops, do check out our YouTube channel where we have winter, spring and summer versions of this workshop as well, already live for you to watch. It's a great way to follow up if you wanna take your learning further. And I'm gonna be telling you where you can get a load more online tree ID resources as well as the night goes on. Okay, folks, so what will you learn in this course? You're going to get a solid grounding in how to identify trees during autumn. We're going to be looking at leaf colour. We're going to be looking at fruit, seeds, nuts, leaf litter, and other kind of seasonal signs, things that are happening out the countryside right now. You're going to learn my three key principles of tree ID, which are like three hacks which get you going um, and putting you in the right mindset to help you identify trees in the countryside. We're going to cover about 16 common species are going to be featured. Others will get mentioned. Some will focus on more than others, but you'll see. We'll be looking at red berries because there's a lot of red berries in our hedgerows and there's several trees which have red berries. So we're going to be looking at them and breaking down the differences between them. So we're not just seeing that wall of red at this time of year. We're going to be looking at common maple trees and how autumn suddenly reveals some big differences between them and how that season can be used for us to identify the different maples. And we're gonna be looking at which leaves fall first and last. And there's gonna be some other content too. At the end, for those of you live, we're gonna have an open Q&A about trees, anything you wanna know about native and common trees of Britain. So do put your questions in the chat room then. And if you're watching the YouTube recording afterwards, you can always put a question in the comments below and I'll do my best to get back to you. And as always with these workshops, we have an exciting announcement all about where you can get further resources. But first folks, a little bit about me so you get to know who I am and who's this person talking at you. Well, my name's James Kendall from Woodland Classroom and um, we run um, outdoor education, bushcraft, nature connection, tree ID, wild food and foraging. We run courses up here in Northeast Wales. We've been doing it since about 2014 with my wife, Lee. Um, and our aim is to reconnect people of all ages with the natural world um, through quality outdoor education and, and connecting ourselves with our ancestors through ancient bushcraft skills, wild food and mindfulness in nature too. So I've also been, I have been on the practical side of things as well. I was a woodland manager for 300 acres of woods in mid Wales. So I've been up close and personal with trees and managing those. And I've always had a passion for trees um, and woodlands and traditional greenwood crafts. And one day, hopefully we will own our own woodland. That'd be fantastic. That's a bit of a pipe dream of ours. So yeah. Brilliant. Let's get straight on with the key principles of tree identification. Now, if you've been on one of these workshops before, you will have heard this, but it's always good to recap. And these are three little tricks that I use to zone myself in to tree ID. And these three tricks are all about narrowing down what you're looking at and eliminating other trees from your inquiry so you can get down to what you're looking at. So let's go through those. Number one is tune in. Number two, begin with a branch. And number three is a question, alternate or opposite? Let's go into what that's all about. So tuning in, tuning into your surroundings. Basically, what we want to do first is slow down. We're hearing this a lot about spending time with nature at the minute, aren't we? Slowing down, taking our time. This is all about when you arrive somewhere, think, where am I? What's the context of the countryside we're in? Are we out just in farmer's field in, you know, typical countryside where we're only going to see certain species? Are we on the urban fringe where there would have been kind of trees for amenity planted and perhaps, you know, retail parks, industrial estates where different species might have been planted, things like dogwood or even sea buckthorn, for instance, as, as ground cover. Are we in an, like a National Trust estate so where exotic species might have been planted a couple of hundred years ago, like Douglas fir or giant sequoia, this kind of thing. If we stop and tune in and think, where am I? 
And generally, what's the history of this place? We don't need a history book, but just think, OK, I'm on a private country estate. They've probably planted some, you know, some exotics a few years ago. Um, I'm right next to the garden, so there might be orchards here, that kind of thing. Or I'm out in the woodland of the estate, so they might have parkland cover and cover for shooting like rhododendron, that kind of thing. Now, you might not know all these species and things straight away, but by slowing down and tuning in, you're asking these questions. And the more you do it, the more you start to expect what to see and think, OK, well, I've been in this kind of environment before and I expect to see this, this, this and this. And that can really help you. OK. Principle number two is begin with a branch. When you look at the whole tree and you're identifying it, it could be a bit overwhelming. Like, Where do you start to ID it? Well, everything you need to know to identify a tree is on a healthy branch. The tip of a healthy branch will tell you everything you need to know. This is a bit of hawthorn. We've got leaves here. We've got leaf and bud arrangement. We've got the fruit and we've got some, some bark on the twig here as well. So there's loads of information right there. So begin with a branch, study a young, healthy branch first. And that works all year round. Principle number three is the question, alternate or opposite? And what I mean by this is looking at the leaf or bud arrangement. Now in winter, we'd be looking at the buds and kind of spring, summer, we're looking at the leaves. At this time of year, depending on how late into autumn you are, you're looking at one or the other, but the arrangement will be the same. They'll either be laid out alternately or in opposites. Let me show you what I mean with my top graphic here. Basically, Buds and leaves are laid out on a, a young, fresh twig, either alternately, one, two, three, four, five, six, or in pairs, two, four, six, eight. All British trees, pretty much, are like this. So if you get to know this pattern, what it means is if you look at a young twig and say, oh, those um, uh, leaves and branches are alternate, it immediately eliminates any species where they are in opposites which again, like tuning in, the more you do this, the more you get to know which species are opposites and it just kicks that out of the park, for instance. Really good thing to know, and we'll apply that to some of the stuff we're doing tonight. Here's an example. Here's wild cherry um, in autumn, beautiful leaves. Um, these are alternate. We can see that there are one, two, three, four, five here. There's not an opposite one here. There's not an opposite one here. These are alternate on the branch. One, two, three, four, five. Most tree species are like this, arranged like this. Whereas field maple here are in opposite pairs. Look, you've got two uh, leaves here, one, two coming out. But also if you look far down the branch, it's a small picture, I appreciate this, but right by my cursor, there's a bud either side, a bud either side there. And just above my cursor there, you can see two buds either side of the twig everything's in opposites, okay? And we'll see this with some species as we go on tonight. Okay, folks. So that's how it works. Everything fine so far. Everybody can hear everything and it's all working. Good, no complaints, that's great. Right, folks, let's get on with the first thing and we'll keep those rules in mind as we ID tonight. Let's go on to some spectacular autumn colors. Because, of course, there's beautiful colours at this time of year out in the countryside. And um, we want to be looking at those. Oops, here we go. We'll get there. There we go. Sorted. Here's a beautiful picture that I took last year. These are beech leaves. And it just shows you the kind of array of fantastic leaf colour you can get at this time of year. Um, beech is one of our best for colour. And, uh, yeah, as we know, beautiful colours. But what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at certain tree species which have a very distinctive color because something like beech, as we can see, has a really wide spectrum. We've got everything from green to brown there and all the yellows and coppers in between. Whereas some species pretty much go one color. And that's really useful to us, especially when IDing trees from a distance, because as we get to know these things and these features, we can start to ID trees from a way distance off. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples of what I mean. Because a lot of trees will go, you know, browns, yellows, but do they go yellow across the board or red across the board? Let's have a look. Here's one here. 
This is a really good example. I'm not going to tell you what this is yet, but a really good example of a tree which stands out from the crowd in this landscape of otherwise kind of dulling greens, browns and yellows. This tree is yellow. There's no way of getting away with that, is there? Definitely, we've got a yellow tree here and that species stands out from the crowd. Let's go through some of them now. So first of all, elder. Now, elder is an interesting one because um, the leaves are out very early. They can be out as early as January. Um, one of the, well, actually the first tree to come into leaf in this country. But this time of year, look out in the hedgerows and you should see this. The green leaves that we can see in the picture on the left are starting to turn this purple color. Really beautiful kind of grape color to it. Very nice. And the veins really stand out. That's really distinctive. Can you see as well that the leaves are in opposite pairs? So alternate or opposite, these are opposite. Just below, my, above my cursor there, there's two. And below my cursor there, two again. Here, there's one missing, but if you look, there is actually a bud there. It just hasn't decided to sprout. So elder in it, opposite pairs here. Knowing this leaf color is useful because once the elderberries have gone, which a lot of us might be familiar with, this leaf color could still be around. It's a good quick way to know what you're looking at. And elder will go this color. And there's the elderberries there, as we can see. We should be familiar with those. They're coming to the end of their season now. There's still some good ones where we are in North Wales and be interested to hear if other people have seen them go already past the best or are they still good for foraging? Here's a good example of some elder leaves here. We've got the, uh, the purpley pink that I've just shown you, the green, what they're normally like um, throughout the summer and early autumn. And then you get some yellows as well. There's a bit of a mix there all round. So this time of year, you could be seeing all three of these in your area. So there's a good example of the leaf shape for elder. The leaf is a compound leaf made up of smaller leaflets. So here you can see five leaflets per leaf. So that's good to know with elder, but look out for that purple. Yeah. Really striking, beautiful stuff. Yeah, there you go. A bit of an idea of the size there. There's my hand comparison. But yeah, and you've got the beautiful stems as well, which are that deep kind of pink purple color as well. Here's another good one. Another shrub that actually looks quite similar to elder at first glance, especially in the winter. This is the Gelder Rose, um, which is also used to be known as Swamp Elder. And I think that's actually a much better name for it because it looks like an elder tree and it likes wet, damp places. So, you know, maybe we'll start a campaign to call this swamp elder because Gelder Rose um, refers to a Gelderland, which I think is in the Netherlands, something to do with um, varieties of this tree that were cultivated. It's not really relevant to us. I think swamp elder might be better. Either way, we have the Latin name to not get confused. But look at this color. We've got a greenish yellow hedgerow here, but in the middle, this big bunch of deep red. This can only be one of two things. And as we get closer, we'll see it to the Gelder Rose. Look at the color of the leaves here, spectacular. And you should be starting to see this right now out in the countryside. Um, different to the elder, um, certainly in the leaf shape. They are in opposite pairs, as we can see there. There's two opposite each other. But the leaves look a bit like um, maples. Um, they're described as maple-like leaves. So they look a bit like that, but they're not a maple. But this color is really, really beautiful. You can see it starts off as green and then just turns as the, as the chlorophyll gives way to the other pigments underneath. Really beautiful stuff. There you go. There's some examples there, some more deeper kind of wine colors. And they look like, you know, real like, like wine, great wine colors, these ones. Really beautiful stuff. Something to look out for, for sure. There's something else on the Gallery Rose that we'll be looking at um, a bit later on, which is another... Um, thing to look out for. Here we go. We've got a hint of it there. And it's got some berries as well, which we'll get it to later when we talk about red berries. But this photo really shows off the variation of colors with Gelder Rose. And as I said, when you're approaching hedgerows, look for the color out there. Look for the, this red color out in the hedgerow. It really just stand out. You can see there the greens and yellows as they then turn to red. And then right in here, we've come in on the beautiful deep red of the Gelder Rose there and the berries right in the middle. Similar to Virginia Creeper, Ginny says, yes, it is a bit, isn't it? There's a Virginia Creeper outside us. It's got similar kind of colors to it for sure. Beautiful stuff for the Gelder Rose. It's pretty common. You should see it out and about. Next one, this is the tree that we had a picture of earlier. It's Hornbeam. It's a tree that um, 
is more common to mid and southern Britain, um, although we do get them around us. But where I see them is planted on country estates or old estates. I haven't seen them, certainly in northeast Wales, in my area, kind of just out in the countryside. So that suggests that they um, like, you know, mid to southern Britain better. So let us know if you've got hornbeam growing um, in your local area. But here we can see that yellow really clear. And what you need to know about hornbeam is that it goes yellow across the board there. So it really stands out. Whoops, let me go back one. There you go. I've got some leaves in my hand there. And the leaves in themselves aren't really that distinctive. They're ovular, like a lot of leaves are, with a pointed tip and a serrated edge. But it's the colour at this time of year which makes it stand out. So a tree like hornbeam, which might blend a little bit into the background the rest of the year, suddenly has this fantastic display. And once you know it, you can spot them a mile off. So really good one to know, hornbeam. I think those spots make it look a little bit like, like ripe banana skin as well. It's a good way of remembering it. Here's the tree a bit closer up, as you can see here, um, really yellow across the board. This was last autumn. Um, yeah, and you actually you can see some hazel in the bottom right hand corner. So it just shows you that there are green leaves still out, whereas this one is really yellow. Let's get the next picture on the go. I missed a picture there. OK, next picture. Spindle. Spindle is the one that you could confuse Gelderose for at a distance because it's another one that can give you this flash of fantastic pink in the hedge. A lot of the trees, um, bar the hornbeam that we're featuring here, are actually um, quite small shrubby trees, um, as opposed to big ground trees, but they're trees nonetheless. Um, this is spindle, and this was last year. We can see some black thorns to the left of the picture. All the leaves have pretty much dropped, and you can see a load of sloes um, sitting in the branches. But in the middle, this flash of pink. Let's go a bit closer, and we can see now these long kind of pointed ovular leaves which are folded a bit like a half open book. And they've got this beautiful pink color to them. And spindle, again, is a tree that doesn't really have any display rest of the year. It just looks, it's either got no leaves in winter or it's just green the rest of the year. Even its spring flowers are green and kind of unobtrusive. But suddenly autumn is its season and it just shines and you get amazing colors like this. And these, this is a collection of spindle leaves from last year which are just beautiful. I think it's more beautiful than Gelder Rose. Um, fantastic colours that really shine out, as we can see in that turn from green to yellow to pink. Beautiful stuff. Let's get the next one. And this is the berry. Uh, I wanted to feature the berry because it is really unique. There's the little seed there, the orange bit hanging down and the fleshy bit below. They look a little bit like, um, kind of like, a little bit like Chinese lanterns hanging down um, really beautiful, um, unique berries, which really complement the pink uh, foliage. So spindle, look out for it, because it really stands out from the crowd at this time of year. There it is on the turn, some slightly larger leaves. You do get more ovular ones, or rounded ones, I should say. And there you can really see the, the bright pink flesh of the, uh, the fruits there at this time of year. So check it out. And also they're in opposite pairs. You can see two opposite each other, and you can just see behind that leaf, Two opposite there as well. Field maple, another which grows in opposite pairs. Interesting that all the colourful ones mostly seem to be in opposite pairs. I don't know if there's some reason for that, but there we go. Field maple is our only native maple, and we're going to get into the maples more later on and look at the difference between them. But what you're looking for with field maple is a general yellow colour again, just like the hornbeam. But the leaf shape, as we can see, is very different. Also, field maple is a smaller tree, generally kind of gets up to about 15 metres high, um, whereas hornbeam can get a lot bigger, uh, quite a large stately tree. Obviously, it depends on the age, but it gives you an idea of kind of what heights and levels to be looking at across the landscape as you're looking. If you're seeing a really huge tree that's yellow, it's probably not a field maple. Um, it's going to be something else. Field maples are most commonly kind of hedgerow, roadside trees, woodland edge, that kind of thing. Just like the Canadian flag though, it's a maple with kind of five lobes, sometimes three, but mostly five, and it's palmate, which means it's shaped like an open palm. Here we can see a really nice view of the yellow leaves there, um, or some of the green just turn into yellow. And with the field maple, as I said, it's the consistency of color, because of course, as I said, with the beach, they do turn yellow, but they also turn 
browns and coppers and you get a real wash across the tree whereas with the ones i'm featuring here you're getting one strong color and that's what makes it stand out and that's certainly the case with the field maple here and the other thing to look for with field maple is you get this carpet of yellow underneath it as the leaves fall and of course as we go on through autumn you get more of that and of course it's going to go brown as time goes on but when they're fresh you get this beautiful carpet of yellow which then you can see as you approach the woodland and you can realize hang on i've got field maple above me without even having to look up so it's a really good thing to look out for beautiful stuff we'll have a look at the differences between maples later on here's dogwood okay very common roadside planted tree um, and also industrial estates, retail parks. It is a native though, but there are lots of cultivars of dogwood which have different color berries and different, slightly different shows of the leaf and the flowers at different time of year. But I'm just talking about our native dogwood here. Um, it's called dogwood because it used to be used to make skewers called dogs for spearing meat on. Um, not because it's anything to do with dogs. <laughs> there you go. And this is a real good picture of the turn. And if you're driving about now, this is what you're going to see. You probably still see the blackberries, but it's the colour of the leaf. This deeper, darker purple rather than the pink of the Gelder Rose and Spindle. It's a different beast, the dogwood. And you can see the purple here on the leaves really showing out. And the red stem of the bark will really shine out as we approach winter. But as you can see in this picture, the berries have gone, but you've got a lot of colour, deep, dark purple colour, a bit like Copper Beach. And this is a small shrubby tree standing along hedgerows, retail parks, industrial estates, planted for cover. And so as you're driving around, obviously watch the road, but look to the side and you'll see purple. And that's patches and blocks of dogwood around the place. OK, here's another one. So uh, dogwood there as well. The red stems really coming through. OK. So here we've got witch elm, okay? Um, a bright yellow leaf. Now, witch elm, of course, green uh, when it's out, like all these uh, leaves, but it goes a bit like hornbeam, that bright banana yellow. Now, witch elm is quite a common tree around my area. Um, you might not have it as um, locally common where you are. Um, it's not as susceptible to the Dutch elm disease as English elm but um, uh, it does regrow. So it gets the disease, it gets knocked back, dies off, and then it comes back again with new fresh growth. But it has these big, large leaves. And you'll see the scale of the leaves in the minute. They are big. They're also very rough to the touch. So not only have you got this bright yellow, banana yellow color, you can feel them and they feel a bit rough like sandpaper. Let me uh, take that. There we go. You can see a real change here between the green and to the yellow. And as time goes on, if I come maybe a few days or a week later, I would have got yellow across the board there. Really, really beautiful stuff. We can see it up in the air, the witch elm. There's an idea of the size of it. You can see it. They can get as big as your hands, these leaves. So they're big, much bigger than the hornbeam. So if you're concerned about them both being yellow and similar shapes, these are much bigger leaves, as big as your hand. They can be, whereas hornbeam, we're talking this kind of size. So yeah, not nowhere near as big. Okay. And witch elm don't generally get to big stately trees because the disease usually gets them, whereas hornbeam can be big trees. Okay, folks. Right. We'll stop that for a second. That's that. There we go. So people are saying they've missed a bit of the content here or there. Of course, you can watch the recording afterwards, folks, and you'll be sent that as soon as I can get the recording up. Just a little note, um, of course, the other things that are going to stand out to us as autumn goes on are the conifers and holly as well, our evergreens. We're not going to go into them here, but of course, as we enter winter, patches of green are left in the countryside. And that tells us straight away, we've got either holly or some evergreens there. So as we get into winter, they really start to stand out from the crowd. On to our next segment, a tale of three maples. Let's talk about the three most common maples that you'll see out in the countryside and how autumn can show us the differences between them. OK, right. Let me just get that up now, folks. Yeah, basically, as I said, we only have one um, maple in this country. That's the, well, one native maple, I should say, the field maple, which is a smaller, shrubbier maple. And it has the yellow leaves, as we know. There's a good range of, pick, of uh, leaf colour there for you to have a look at. Now, we're not just using 
the leaves here, we're going to start using some other signs. We're going to use the fruits or the helicopters, as people know these as. And these helicopter wings are um, going to help, of course, the seed travel, excuse me, a little further from the tree. The wings on field maple are typically at 180 degrees to each other. So they sit flat. You do get them sitting down as well, but look across the whole tree and generally you'll see the wings doing that. That's important, that's field maple, okay? Here's some more samples of field maple. As we can see, we've got wings that have fallen onto the ground. Some of them have been chewed by animals. They've eaten seed inside, um, but uh, they spin best actually when you break them in half and just throw one wing up in the air. That spins much better. When you're looking on the floor, you'll see this. Um, along with that yellow leaf litter, you'll start to see these wings sitting around the place. And you can see the wings looking a bit green there, but as the season goes on, they'll get browner as they're ready to fall. As the moisture is drawn out of them, they get more papery, more thin, lighter, so the wind can carry them further. Another sign would feel maple that our other two maples we're going to talk about don't have is this. You don't see it on all field maples, but it's pretty common. And it's what I call crocodile's back. Um, and you get this on the bark of field maple trees. And, it's, and you can actually push these little things in. They're quite squashy, these little ridges. But it looks like the back of a crocodile just sitting in the water there. So think of that and look for it on the branches and trunk of field maple. And you may well see it. And it's good because the other two maples we featured don't have this. So that's field maple just quickly. But let's go back to the key principles here. These leaves are all in opposites because all maples have their leaves and buds in opposite pairs, which we can see if I go back to, nope, no examples there, but never mind, we'll show you in a bit. The leaves are in opposite pairs and the buds too. And of course the maples all have a maple-like leaf. So they have a very similar looking leaf shape, okay? So this is where we're really picking apart the differences. This is sycamore. Sycamore is a maple although it doesn't have it in its name. But if you look at its Latin name, it's an Acer. So it's of the family of maples, of course. Acer pseudoblatanus. And uh, this is not a native, but it is naturalized. You do get it all over the countryside, of course. You've probably got one growing or several near you. They can be quite a little bit of an invasive habit to them. They're quite uh, prolific and um, shade a lot of things out, but uh, they grow very well and produce excellent timber. But let's look at the ID. Firstly, the leaf is bigger. You know, uh, it can be at least twice the size of a maple leaf. Secondly, um, the lobes are less rounded, they're more pointed. And thirdly, this tar spot fungus that you're seeing, these black spots, only sycamore gets this, okay? Field maple and our other maple don't get this. So if you see these black spots, it's got to be sycamore, okay? You see these black spots everywhere from kind of midsummer right through to when the leaves fall. And it's a fungus that just lives with the tree. It doesn't harm it that much. And it just lives with the tree, goes around the cycles each year. But you only see it on sycamore. The other thing about sycamore is the colour. Now, the one on the right is about the most excitingly coloured sycamore leaf I've ever found because they don't have a great display of colour. They have a pretty kind of dirty display of colour in the grand scheme of things. Whereas field maple have this lovely yellow. Um, sycamore is much more dirty and mixed kind of greens and browns, that kind of thing. You do get some yellows, but generally across the board, not a good display from sycamore. And that's really important because it sets it apart from our other two maples, okay? Here's the helicopters of sycamore. And look how they're pointing down. They're downswept the wings, aren't they? They're not at that 180 degrees that we saw with the field maple, okay? So straight away, again, we've got another sign. The wings are also bigger than field maple as well. Um, again, split them in half, chop one up in the air and it will spin and of course, that's what it's doing at this time of year. So different shape there. There's typical sycamore leaves, not really giving us a display, just going dry, curling up, starting to crisp, and then they'll fall and we'll just get a, a green brown mess all over the floor. No lovely yellow carpet. There's the seeds again, looking good. And a nice collection of autumn finds with some tar spot fungus as well. And just showing you the difference in the leaf size too. Here's a different beast though. This is Norway maple, the last of our three maples. And this is very commonly planted around the UK. There's a big patch of it near me and you do get it along roadsides a lot. It's a very attractive tree. It's not a native, um, but we'll see why people plant it in a second. 
Straight away, we can start to see a hint of something different here in this picture in the center, there's a hint of color, okay? The leaves are about the size of sycamore leaves, same kind of size, but whereas sycamore, if I whiz back, are quite clearly five pointed lobes, the Norway maple is like a sycamore turned up to 11. It's more jagged, there's more points and spikes on the whole leaf. So that's really, uh, really good stuff all around and uh, really just mark it out. Everything is more dramatic with the Norway maple, okay? Whoops, oh, there we go. And here's some colors. Look at these spectacular colors that start to come through on the Norway maple. It's, now it does this, it really is nothing like uh, what you get with the sycamore. It really is a different beast. Look at these fantastic yellows that we're getting. And we're not gonna confuse it with field maple because these leaves are twice the size and they're much more spiky in their lobes. And you get some beautiful reds and pinks on these leaves as well, some beautiful stuff with Norway maple. So certainly one to look out for. You've probably got it growing near you. But whereas in summer, we would just see green maple leaves, autumn reveals the differences. There's a comparison with Norway maple on the left and sycamore on the right. Really clear with the difference between the two at this time of year. And then out in the hedgerow, we've got Norway maple tree on the left looking yellow. On the right, sycamore looking a dirty green brown. So really just show you side by side, they are really quite different. So thanks to those trees for planting themselves side by side. And here's the Norway maple um, helicopters, um, the wing sea cases, much bigger than the others. As you can see in here, they've browned off. Here's our three seeds side by side. Field maple left, sycamore middle, Norway maple on the right. And look how much bigger the Norway maple um, seeds are. You know, we're talking this kind of size. They're big, big wing seed cases. So I hope that's been useful in terms of um, getting to know our three different maples, folks. OK, hope that's really useful. Right, good, good, good. Next section, let's go on to a sea of red berries. Now we mentioned this earlier, how when you're out in the hedgerow, there's lots of red berries all over the place. And do we know the difference between them? Can we recognize the difference between these red berries? So let's have a little look at what's going on between the different ones and break down the differences. Because if we look at the berries on our own, we don't get the full picture. But once we add the leaves into the mix as well, we get more of what's going on. So it's always a case of looking closer. That's what's important. Now there's probably about five common species which have red berries. Here's four of them. So four red berries you're gonna see at this time of year, all from different tree species, okay? Let's go through them all and see what we've got here. Firstly, the rowan, okay? Or mountain ash, you might know it as. The leaves are alternate, one, two, three, four, five not in opposite pairs, okay? Which mark it out from the ash tree, which it does look a bit like in its leaf shape, okay? There are more leaflets though in the rowan, but what we're looking at this time of year, the thing that stands out are those berries, the big clusters, the umbels of red berries, and they're a bright red color. And that's important because when we look at some of the others, we'll see that they're duller, whereas these really do zing out to the eye. And when you look at them across the tree, you notice the deep and um, dense clusters of berries, um, how they are not spread out across the whole tree, but there are deep, dense clusters. And that's important as we'll see. But these were taken yesterday, these photos, and this is what we're seeing right now up on the mountain tops where the mountain ash grows, okay? Now, the leaves themselves are not giving a great display of color really. Sometimes they can go red, um, especially with some cultivars, but generally they just add to the background color of autumn. They don't go a specific color, which is why we didn't include them. But there's an idea of what you're looking with the leaves. Here again are the berries in clusters around the tree. And that red does ping out as the leaves start to dull back. The red does stand out to the eye. It's a small compact tree as well. Um, it doesn't spread itself out that much. So you see looking for a small compact character. There's our berries again, seen really clearly growing in those clusters on the long stalks. They're actually a wild food. You can use them for, for foraging, but they must be cooked. You can't eat them raw um, because they are um, gonna give you a bit of an upset stomach um, because I think it's ascorbic acid that's in them. So uh, do cook them if you're gonna use them for something like jelly. We'll come back to Rowan a little bit later. Here's the Gelder Rose, okay? We saw the leaves earlier. Here's the berries which accompany it. 
Again, a cluster of small red berries. But if we compare the difference, the rowan are, are bright, but they are matte in their finish. Whereas Gelder Rose are glossy and shiny and they look much juicier it, with a Gelder Rose. If you were to pick it, it's just going to kind of burst with its juice. Whereas a Rowan, a little bit more meat to it. Um, so, yeah. And of course, with the Gelder Rose, generally we're looking a little bit lower down in the hedgerow rather than kind of up on its own and a slightly higher height. So that's important. And there you go. There's that picture again with a beautiful red behind it. With the Rowan, we don't have that, do we? There's some um, examples of the Gelder Rose there, and we can see the opposite pairs of branches. So again, it's in opposites, whereas the Rowan is alternate along the branch. And nice clusters of berries there, really beautiful color. Hawthorn, this is the one that most people will know. Very common in our landscape. Uh, probably the second, the second, if not most common tree in hedgerows along with Blackthorn. What we're looking at here though, are the haws, okay? And um, which is what we call the berries there. They're out now, and I think this year has been a really bumper crop for them. The red berries are scattered across the whole tree, not so much in clusters. And as we look here, we can see that they're more scattered throughout. They're also a duller, darker red, more of a maroon than a bright red, okay? There's a cluster of berries up close. They're ovular. They've got this little star at the end of them. They're not round like the rowan berries, they're oval in shape. And also if you squash them, you get like a yellow green flesh inside and they're much more pasty uh, rather than being very juicy and just bursting straight away. There's more substance to them. What's also interesting about the hawthorn is that there's not a big display of color either. You get a mix of browns, yellows, sometimes reds in there as well. Um, you don't get a single color like you do with the gelder rose. It's much more like the rowan in that sense. And of course it has thorns. So we'll be looking out for that too. The white beam, um, another one to know. Now the white beam is a sorbus, it's related to the rowan, um, but it's a much bigger tree. The leaves are bigger, the berries are bigger. These are the biggest berries actually out of all the ones we're including in this segment by far. And white beam is a tree that you will often see in kind of urban areas, maybe in car parks, town parks, gardens, because there are lots of different cultivars of white beam, although there is the native is sorbus area but there's quite a few cultivars and other species of sorbus as well, um, which have been brought in from other parts of the world. But this white bean berry is something to look out for, for sure. Look at the leaves, very different to rowan, not made up of lots of little leaflets, but one ovular leaf may be lobed as well. You do get variation between different white beans. But look out for those berries as well. So on their own, we might get confused between that and the rowan or the hawthorn, but as soon as you see the leaves, we start to get the difference in shape there. Again, no great display of color there, a bit of a mottled mix. There's a good example of some white bean berries there. And again, you're looking higher up than you would with uh, the hawthorn generally. White bean can get to a good sizable tree. And there we are in more dense clusters than the hawthorn. And these ones have an almost orange tint to them, but the leaves are much bigger. The leaves can be almost as big as your hand, whereas hawthorn leaves are like this, much smaller all round. And there's some white beam giving a bit of color at the end. I don't see yellow consistently across it, but I thought it's worth including because you can see that there is some color from the tree. Good stuff. Not a wild food, by the way. Don't go eating this one. <laughs> Here's the last one of our red berries. This is an interesting one. One traditionally found by waysides and pathsides. So it was given the name, the wayfaring tree. And this one is related to gelder rose. So we can see a bit of pattern here. Very different leaves though. Look, they don't go an interesting color, do they? They get, they're, they're not much color there at all from the leaves. What we have got are these berries, which are really interesting. The leaves are in opposite pairs again, there we go. But the berries are interesting because you don't just get red berries, you get black as well. So I think of it, um, for any Beano fans out there, I think of Dennis the Menace with the black and red. So look for that mix of black and red. If you got that, it can only be the wayfaring tree because there's no other kind of common British tree which has multiple colors of berries that I can think of off the top of my head, certainly not this time of year. So red and black clusters means the wayfaring tree. And this is a small tree, um, nice one to look out for. One more of kind of mid to Southern Britain again and Eastern Britain, I would say more so than where we are. And there we can see the clusters of berries at the end, the leaves in opposite pairs and the big oval leaves. By the way, folks, um, you're going to get a link to this, this free autumn tree ID guide. If you've not seen it already by email, 
I'm going to give you this guide. Um, it's a digital copy, not a physical one. I can't send you all a physical one, but um, you can get a PDF, which you can download to your phone and you can use it to look at these berries and other autumn signs um, when you're out and about on a country walk. So do check that out, the free autumn tree ID guide. And I'm going to send it to you in an email via a link after this workshop. Cool. Right. Okay, folks, just checking everything's okay. Right, um, we're gonna go on to seed dispersal very um, quickly and go into a bit of that. Everybody okay, let's go for it. Seed dispersal, there are different ways that seeds spread, of course, um, not just um, with, the, uh, with berries, which get eaten by animals. There are other ways too. We have wind dispersal, so seed spread by the wind. Um, easy to uh, work it out, of course. The big one is the birch for this. We've already seen this with maples with their wing seed cases, of course, spreading by wind. But birch, which are very common and really kind of the master pioneer tree, they have a lot of tiny, tiny wing seed cases, which are the result of the mature female catkins, which is what you can see here on the left. And they will break up into lots of tiny, tiny wing seeds. And with wind dispersal, the wings are always much bigger than the seed they're carrying. It just so happens that with birch, the wings are really, really small. So you can see in here, each one of those breaks up into hundreds of seeds. And across the tree, there must be tens, if not hundreds of thousands of these seeds across the tree. And birch sends these out. And if you throw them up in the air, you'll see how far they travel and you see how birch spreads itself as a pioneer into new open areas and colonizes open ground, turning it into scrub, into young woodland to um, basically start the natural process of succession. So that's the birch there, really beautiful thing. So get a birch catkin and um, put it between your fingers and just watch it crumble into thousands of seeds. It's, it's really quite cool to have a go. You can see the catkins there, really nice stuff. I do like the birch, it's a beautiful tree. Ash also is spread by wind dispersal. These dark bunches you can see in the canopy here are bunches of ash keys. You can see them clear in these pictures here. They're big, dense bunches of brown keys which dangle down at this time of year. Again, like the sycamore, they've gone brown and papery. They've lightened up, ready to fly on the wind. And a single wing has a twist in it. And that twist, of course, helps catch the wind, helps it spin, and helps it travel just that little bit further from the parent tree. So you really look out for these up in the canopy with ash trees because um, they, they do throw out a lot of these bunches of keys. Um, there you go. There's a single ash key. Gives you a bit of an idea of the scale of them in my hand there. But uh, yeah, really good one to know. Only time's going to tell how much the ash dieback is going to be affected, uh, is going to affect um, how well ash do. But they are very prolific and they do spread a lot of seed and you get a lot of young ash trees growing on the ground. So hopefully they will find a way to combat the disease eventually if we give them a chance. Here's hornbeam, which we mentioned earlier, the large yellow tree that stood out on its own. We didn't talk about the seeds though. And the seeds are great because they really help it stand apart from beech, which is a tree it often gets confused with because it has similar bark, similar kind of shape, similar leaves. Um, and in winter, they do look very similar. But these, these um, uh, seeds are really distinctive. They hang down in clusters, um, they look like a bit like a car wash brush, I think, or maybe a toilet brush, depending on which version of that picture you like best. And they start off green and they turn um, papery brown and then they will split apart and spread on the wind. And you can see a bunch that I've collected there dangling down in cascades with the horn beam. Whereas with the beach, of course, you have the beach nut, which is very different. Here's a nice display of the yellow, you know, going from the green to the yellow of the seed cases and the brown on the left. In the middle, you can see an individual one. So each kind of seed there or nutlet, as it's called, has a kind of three pronged um, winged um, wing to them, which helps them fly. <laughs> so, okay, Let's move on to other animal dispersal because we talked about berries, but there are other things that animals can eat. And that's, of course, nuts. And that's what we're going to talk about just briefly here. Most of us know sweet chestnuts. Um, but the thing is with sweet chestnuts, what they're trying to do is get picked up by the animals, and hopefully not eaten, but cashed away. And either the animal forgets that they put it there, or perhaps the animal doesn't make it through the winter 
and then that nut has a chance to germinate. So that's what it's trying to do. Obviously, if the nut gets nibbled there and then, there's not a lot they can do about it. But uh, yeah, sweet chestnuts, most of us know them from, you know, Christmas time, roasting chestnuts, but of course we can forage them in this country. Very prickly cases, um, big, large leaves. There's a sweet chestnut leaf there. You can see they've got a lot of size to them compared to my hand. It's a big old leaf. Um, very different to the horse chestnut leaf, as we'll see. But uh, yeah, look out for these big nuts and of course the cases on the floor. And that leads us to horse chestnut or conker, as some people know it. Not related to sweet chestnut whatsoever, but they both have similar nuts. So they're both called chestnuts. The leaves are very different, but the conkers look to me like sea land, sea mines, the old sea mines floating on the water with the spikes, not as densely spiked. Um, and of course, they're going to have conkers that we all know from childhood, playing conkers in the schoolyard. Not a wild food. We can't eat them, but we can make soap from them. Uh, and often you'll see horse chestnut in parks, town parks, estates, that kind of place. That's why we're looking for it. Just quickly, the hazel. Um, hazelnuts, very hard to get a good crop of hazelnuts to forage for yourself because you've got to beat the squirrels. We know hazelnuts, of course, from things like Nutella, chocolate spreads, that kind of thing. But what you're more likely to find on the ground at this time of year is this. Hazelnuts tend to be more very back end of August and September is the best time for them. Um, but you'll find this on the ground below the hazelnut tree. These broken and split shells, look out for those nibbled by animals on the woodland floor. You can see a good selection there of finds under a mature hazel tree. So start looking on the ground and see what's fallen over the last month or where the animals or squirrels have been nibbling them. And uh, you'll find this kind of thing. And that will give you a good sign that you've got the hazelnuts, of course. And if you find an intact one, why not plant it? We have planted some in pots and they've done very well. But very hard to get a crop for yourself. Beech nuts um, in their mast, which are like an ovular egg, which opens up and splits open to reveal the nuts inside. Those masts are covered in bristles. Um, they're not spiky to touch, but they're like little hairy bristles. And that really helps it stand out from the hornbeam, I think. But inside that mast are the nuts. OK, so here's a couple of the nuts really close up because these nuts are small and they're triangular which is really unique. So really easy to spot on the floor when you see them because they stand out um, because of their shape. Inside that brown shell is eventually the nut or you hope there's a nut because a lot of the time you open it up and there's nothing inside. Um, so it just depends on how good a year the beach is having. But you're gonna find a lot of this on the floor and also hanging on the branches at this time of year. You can have a look inside, there might be some nuts that opens up or if it's really open, the nuts might have fallen onto the floor already. So look for the mast and the nuts on the branch and on the floor below the tree. That's what you're after. But they, they make a good wild food. If you can get a nice sized nut inside that shell, it's, it's a nice little snack on the go, actually. Good stuff all around. There's some more beech nuts. You can see them triangular, really distinctive, but they're only small folks, um, you know, only about as long as a fingernail. And then acorns, but we'll get to them soon. The last one is water dispersal. So we've talked and wind and animal dispersal. But there's one tree which spreads itself by water dispersal. And that's the older, a tree we've not talked about yet. It's an interesting tree because it's the only native broadleaf tree that has cones. We have, of course, the Scots pine um, that has cones. But uh, the older has cones. They're not true cones, but they certainly look like it. These are the mature female catkins, which are split and open. And older often grows by water and rivers and damp places. You'll see it there along canal sides as well. And the seeds drop out of there into the water, flow down river, and they lodge in the bank and hopefully make new trees. So they rely on being close to water to reseed. And when they're mature, they're brown, but they can also be green when they're young. And you might see some green ones still on the branch now, which quite aren't mature yet. The leaves are alternate on the older, not in opposite pairs, as we can see here. And there's a nice collection of finds. You can see some male catkins, which are the little um, long tubular things. And then we have the green immature female catkins and the mature female catkins as well. There we are, a really nice shot of them. And uh, yeah, one of the trees that spreads itself by water dispersal. So just interesting because 
once we start to look at all these different seeds, nuts and things, we start to think, well, how does a seed spread? What's going on? And it makes sense. If older likes growing in wet places, it might as well use the water to its advantage. OK, folks. Brilliant. They look like brown garlic cloves, Esmeralda says. They do a bit, don't they? Uh, I'm presuming you're talking about the beach. Cool. Now, if you're not seeing any fruits on a tree, any seeds, any nuts, any berries, you could well be looking at this time of year at a willow or a poplar. Because those trees, which are related, have done all their seeding earlier in the year. So the fact that they don't have any seeds, nuts, fruits, berries on them tells you is quite distinctive in itself and tells you, aha, is this a willow or poplar? So something to look out for because they have the big fluffy seed heads uh, in summer and they've done everything they need to do by this time of year. So the absence of any fruiting bodies could suggest you've got willow or poplar there. Let's talk about acorns and just distinguishing the difference between our two native oaks. We've got two native oaks in Britain, the peduncular oak, otherwise known as the English oak, and the sessile oak. OK, of course, they both produce acorns. But at this time of year, it's really easy to tell the difference between the two species. OK, in terms of wildlife value, they're both the same. Um, the English peduncular or peduncular oak tends to be more Midlands, southern Britain, the sessile oak more northwestern uplands. But to be honest, they get planted all over the place. But in their natural range, that's what they like. This is the peduncular oak, called so because the acorns hang on peduncles, these um, long stalks, okay, in, in their cups. So peduncular oak, the acorns hang on stalks, whereas the leaves don't really have stalks, okay? The leaves grow almost right on the branch, okay? That's important. The sessile oak, which is our other common oak, is the opposite way round. So sessile means stalkless, and it's referring to the acorns. Look at the acorns here. They're in a cluster and they're growing without a stalk. They're not dangling. If I go back, that one's dangling on a long stalk, English oak, sessile oak, in clusters, no, excuse me, stalks there, they're stalkless, they are sessile. However, <coughs> I said it's opposite. The leaves on sessile oak do have a leaf stalk, okay? As we'll see, you can see one there. So you can see a leaf stalk between the branch and the uh, base of the leaf. I've got them both side by side here, okay? You've got sessile oak on the left and English or peduncular oak on the right. Um, unfortunately, on the peduncular oak, you can't see the stalk there because of the shadow, but there is a long stalk there. But here on the left, the sessile oak clusters, the acorn cups are in clusters, and the leaf has a long stalk where my cursor is and the leaf on the right has no stalk okay so that's the difference between our two oaks okay sessile oak are stalkless with the acorns peduncular oak or english oak have stalks have a look at an oak near you and see which one it is if you've seen quite a dramatic spiky oak leaf it's some non-native oak that's been planted so best to look in the countryside rather than a town or park or garden first that's what i would advise if you're starting to study oaks OK, one last tree I want to talk about before I tell you how you can get some more uh, resources and bits. I want to tell you about a rule breaker. It's always interesting to go and have a look at a tree which breaks the rules just to prove how awesome nature is. Uh, this is the larch, not a native, but something you'll commonly see in Britain. And it's a non-native conifer, often put in the forestry plantations. A green, evergreen, or so it would seem, conifer with little uh, green needles most of the year and cones. However, at this time of year, you're going to start seeing this. Look at these two larches and the needles have gone yellow, a really gold, warm yellow as well. It's a lovely colour, very autumnal. This is a conifer that drops its leaves. It's not an evergreen. It's a conifer that isn't an evergreen. It breaks the rule. This is great for us as tree ideas because it means we can spot it a mile off in autumn. So you can impress your friends knowing you can see a larch. Here they are with the yellow needles. You can also see in the picture on the right, a lot of the small um, black round um, dots. That's of course the cones. 
If I go a bit closer, let's have a little look here and we'll see. There we go, let me go back one. You'll see um, where we can see closer the golden yellow needles there. Really, really beautiful stuff all around. Um, and look at the lumpy branches, that's important too. There's another close up shot in the studio of the small cones growing right on the branch and those golden golden uh, needles that you're gonna start seeing starting to turn from now onwards, okay? It's interesting because you see a big block of forestry, particularly in upland areas, Wales, Yorkshire, all these places, um, and you see a wall of green, and then you just see a block of yellow, and it's gonna be large if they're conifers, so you can spot them really easily. Here they are in winter. So once they've gone yellow, the needles drop, and it looks like you're looking at dead trees, um, but of course, they're just large, sleeping, waiting for the new growth in the new year. If we look close, here's a really good picture because it shows you the outline of what to look for. And there's a rhyme that I learned from my bushcraft teacher, which is lumpy large. And um, it's easy to remember that. If you look at all the little lumps all over the branches there, they're the little nodules where the cones grew and the branches and twigs are lumpy. So if it's lumpy, it's lumpy large. An easy way to remember it in winter. Look for that silhouette. Okay. Right, folks, a bit of a whistle stop tour of um, trees there. We're going to do a QA and a in a minute, um, open Q&A. We'll run over a few minutes, but I'm happy to stay on if people have got burning questions. But before we go to that, I'd like to tell you guys where you can get some more good stuff, because if you've been really fired up for learning about trees with this, and I hope you've enjoyed it so far, um, this is actually a lot of these resources are from an online tree ID course that I've created. So let me tell you guys about that, because um, I'm going to send you some more free resources via email after this. And if you're watching on YouTube, um, I'm going to put some links in the comments in the description. So, folks, if you want to be a tree expert, I have some good news because I've created an online course. It's taken me three years to make this so far, and it's still being built on and more content's being made for it. But this is an online course where you can watch videos and download cheat sheets and look at photo galleries and join live workshops with other students throughout a whole year and learn about all the native trees around us, up to 35 species of tree. And we're going to take you from clueless to confident on your journey to becoming a tree expert. OK, so you get when you join the course, you get all this stuff. And a lot of the photos from tonight are from the course. All the ones in the studio are all photos you can download. You get cheat sheets. Um, not just like the one I'm going to give you for free, but all these as well. When you join, you get a cheat sheet for every season. So you can look at field maple in winter, spring, summer, autumn, download a little sheet to your phone or print it out, stick it in your pocket. And when you're on a walk, you can look at the top four or five signs to look out for to tell you, for instance, you've got field maple, ash, hazel, whatever it is you're looking at. There's also hundreds of photos of the trees in all four seasons out on location and in the studio as well. So I've done loads of photos going through all the details so you can look out ahead of time and see what you're gonna see out in the woods. And if you bring a sample back home, you can compare it with your photos and really look at what you're looking at there. Okay, so the course has up to 35 native, common, native and common trees in all four seasons. So you'll see me standing out in videos in all weathers and um, talking about trees. We do live workshops just for students. So like we've done tonight, but with different content and just for the paid students on the course where it's more free and they can ask more questions. Um, you get the cheat sheets and also you can get one to one coaching with me as well with it. So we can come onto a Zoom call together and spend an hour talking trees and getting you where you need to be if you really want to get to know trees in your landscape. I'm also doing a special offer for everyone who's come tonight um, as a thank you for spending an hour with me. I'm doing 20 percent off on the courses. It's for seven days only, though. So it's going to start on Friday. OK, so 20 percent off all the different levels of the course. Emily will put a link in the chat room in a minute. There's some feedback from the students. We've got um, a lot of students on there and um, they've all really enjoyed it. Lots of lovely feedback from them. People at all levels of learning as well from all over the UK. And it's been great to get their feedback on the course. And it's been a lot of fun for me, too. But not only that, if you sign up to the course, I'm going to give you another free course included. It's called Your Wild Food Year. We've touched on foraging tonight, but what you're going to get if you sign up to the course, um, depending on which level you sign up to, you'll get either an introductory or full version of Your Wild Food Year, where we go through month by month all the wild foods you can find. 
it's not just me that presents those workshops and lessons in the course. You get all these expert speakers as well from all across the UK, some really well-known names there and authors on wild food and foraging. It's really great folks come in each month. It's something we filmed all last year through lockdown as we went through the best wild food you can find. And included in there is not only monthly foraging videos, but also bonus videos like how to forage sea buckthorn, how to find dryad saddle or giant puffball. All kinds of stuff is in there. There's loads of content. And you'll get all this if you sign up to the tree course as a bonus. So I think it's a good deal. But wait, there's more. If signing up to pay course is not your thing at the minute and you want to try the try before you buy, I've made a free version of the course, which is just an introductory version. It's called Kickstart Your Tree ID Skills. It's the little logo you've been looking at in the corner of the screen here the whole time. And I'm going to send you a link to that via email tonight as well. And this is three native trees in all four seasons, okay, with videos, cheat sheets, and photo galleries. Try that out. If you like that, have a look at the paid course. Have a look at the 20% offer. Um, so as I said, loads of free content coming your way, guys, as well as your free guide. Look out for that on an email after this workshop. Or if you're watching on YouTube, look out for the link in the description for that free guide that you can get your hands on to find out about autumn trees. Um, handmade, lovingly by my fair hands. So folks, whew, that's a lot of information. I think it's about time I took a breather and we took some questions. So Emily, if you could put some links up to some of the stuff we've talked about. And if anyone has a question in the chat room, I know we've reached time, but I'm happy to stay on for 10 minutes and answer any specific questions people have about anything we've talked about tonight or anything else to do with trees. I'll do my best to answer them for you. Or if you have any questions about the course, let us know. But happy to stay on for a bit. Lots of people saying thanks very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. There's a lot of work goes into these workshops. So uh, I appreciate that. Which maples produce syrup? Bilbo asks, I tell you what, there's a lot of Bilbos in the room tonight, aren't there? Um, it's the sugar maple, which is North American. It's not a native and it's not really planted that much in this country. There are a few here and there. I know there's one in Runcorn in Cheshire that I know of, but it's the sugar maple that we're looking at for that. Um, apparently you can tap sycamore, but I've never tried it. And it's not something that's widely written about in foraging books, which suggests to me, is it that good? I can't speak from personal experience, so I don't know. But certainly it's not anywhere anywhere near on a part of sugar maple. Right, folks. Questions, questions. Esmeralda says, thanks. Awesome Zoom. That's brilliant. Would love to know how to identify silver birch versus downy birch. Well, that's a good question, Siobhan. My answer to that is a little bit cheeky. Um, join the course because I do it on that. Um, I don't go, do go through the details. Very briefly, though, um, downy birch has downy hairs on the young twigs and on the leaves. And also silver birch, Betulus pendula, has pendulous branches hanging down. OK, there's a little sneak peek. There's more to it, but just a little bit for you. But we do break it down. They do hybridize as well, though, which is a nightmare. Um, are those real birches behind you, Hannah asks? Uh, sure. Um, it's always sunny and dry in this woodland. Um, different woods for burning, Sarah asks. Well, all wood burns, but some wood is better for burning than others. If you're in a real situation, the best firewood you've got is the firewood you've got to hand. But birch makes great wood to start with, especially birch twigs, because the birch bark is um, impregnated with oil, uh, has natural oil in it. So it burns very bright and hot quickly. So it's a good one to get a fire started or to boil a kettle or brew or billy can quickly. But hardwoods like oak and beech, they're really going to last and give you long standing heat. So if you're looking for an overnight fire or something for your for your wood burning stove at night, your hardwoods are good. Ash is good because it has a low moisture content and you can burn it green because um, I think it only has that 20 percent moisture content. So it does burn green. So ash is a good one to know as well. So Neat has been trying to find a juniper bush. Uh, juniper is difficult to find. There are some on the North Wales coast that I found and I filmed them for the course, but um, it's a difficult one to find. Juniper is one of our three native conifers, but uh, look um, upland areas, coastlines, rocky outcrops, that kind of thing, or country estates because you do get ornamental versions of juniper as well, tall and pointed. Hazel asks, which is the best wood to use for crafts for children? She's a forest school leader. Hi, Hazel. I'm a forest school leader as well. I think one of the best craft woods for kids is hazel. Um, easy to remember because it's your name. It grows very quickly. 
um, in the grand scheme of things. Nice long rods, and it has lots of forks on it, which can be used for kind of props for cooking or for marshmallow toasting forks or for campfire gadgets, for hanging a pot around the fire, that kind of thing. It also splits very well, so you can split it and use it for weaving. Um, but the other one is willow, of course, because willow grows very quick um, and you can harvest it every year and it will grow back. And you can get lots of rods for bending, making baskets, willow crowns, hoopla, all that kind of stuff. So I'd say willow and hazel are your best if you're using a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, try that. Mia asks, did I say beech nuts are edible? They are edible, Mia. Yes, you can eat them. They're very nice, but they're quite small. And there are good years and bad years. We were going to talk about mast years, but I didn't get a chance because we ran out of time. Um, but um, beech have mast years when they throw out a lot of nuts. In my local area, this doesn't look like a mast year. I don't know if anyone else has seen a lot of beech nuts this year or a lot of acorns. I've not seen many acorns at all this year where I am. Uh, whereas last year I saw quite a few. But yes, beech nuts, edible, nice but you've got to get them. And a lot of the shells open up and they're empty. So it's a bit of a bit of a lottery. Another Bilbo asks, what's the fastest growing tree? <laughs> the fastest growing tree is um, the willow. Um, there's um, hosier willow, Salix vignalis, that can grow about 16 foot a year if given the right conditions. And this is what they're using for biomass. It Re grows very prolifically. Right, folks, that's probably enough for now. If you have any other burning questions, get in touch with me. Um, or if you join a course, the course, um, you can ask me next week when we do our live workshop with students. I'm going to send you all an email tonight with a link to the free taster course, the tree ID guide, and watch out for some more emails coming over the next few days as we launch the special offer, which launches on Friday, okay, with 20% off for the main course. I'll probably send you guys some videos as well, some extra content that's not available elsewhere as a thank you for being part of the launch and being here tonight. But thank you for joining us, guys. If you've liked this, tell other people. It will go on YouTube in a week or so's time and they can enjoy it too. And if you have any questions, give me a shout at trees at woodlandclassroom.com. Thanks for your time, folks. Um, it's been really good. That's the end of the presentation, folks. Goodbye, folks, for now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care. Mm -hmm.